I think I want to say if we ask the question, uh, how can we create a society with no losers, where everybody's uh, basic needs are met, um, <clears throat> we're subject to a couple of methodological inadequacies. One is that we can travel around the world and we can find all sorts of <coughs> successful programs. We can find all sorts of places where people were poor and now they're making it. Um, we can find all sorts of cases where people were poor and now they're making it. Um, it, it may be a, a community currency program, a community revitalization program, a, a job training program. Um, but I think there are two things immediately to bear in mind about this. Um, <coughs> One is that you may not be creating any jobs. You may simply be training people, and you pronounce your program a success because all of your trainees got employment, but that meant someone else didn't. They just simply outdid the competition with your guys. So if you propose to the International Labor Office, I found the cure to unemployment, you haven't. You've, un you've employed a lot of unemployed youth, but the untold unemployment hasn't gone up. And um, a second one is you can easily find programs that work but they cannot be funded at a sufficient scale. They're too expensive. So you can't, uh, you can't actually eliminate poverty. On the other hand, it is possible to eliminate poverty and eliminate employment. The physical resources are there, but we have to go to the level of structure. We have to think in terms of, of, a, uh, of a structural change because within the basic structure we have, uh, although we can tell many success stories, uh, we can't, um, we can't solve the problem. So I'll start with my cheat sheet uh, two. Uh, a proof that the old methods of social transformation are insufficient is that in fact they have produced no society with decent work for all, monetary stability, just levels of inequality, compliance with human rights, and sustainable harmony with nature. Uh, it just this hasn't happened. And I want, I want to say that, well, there's a reason, a structural reason why it hasn't happened. Because the very sort of uh, basis of everything is the Tausch principle and the, uh, the, the principle of exchange. And this is a principle that necessarily produces losers. Uh, let me give an example from my, my law practice. Um, when I practiced uh, law in California, I was a specialist in insolvency and bankruptcy reorganizations of businesses. And I had a client who was in the wholesale fruit and vegetable business, and he had uh, had a success of his business, and now he wasn't making a success of his business. Now he had more debts than he could pay. And I remember very clearly one day in my office he said to me, he said, Howard, I know my business is, is bottom up, but I, I'll promise you, Howard, if you can just be, get me out of this mess that I'm in, from now on I will always be right side up. I promise you I will always be right side up. What did he mean by that? What did he mean by right side up? What he meant by being bottom up was he had more payables than receivables. And what he meant by being right side up was having more receivables than payables. Right? Okay, well, enter, for example, John Maynard Keynes, Randall Ray, the economists who do a lot of work with accounting identities. If you add up all the account receivables and all the payables over the whole society, it's impossible for everybody to have more receivables and payables. When you, when you do things with this money criterion, our goose is cooked. Uh, you've got to have other criteria, other ways of doing things, because if everybody's motivation is to have more money than the other guy, it simply, it simply can't, can't happen. I can give another example. Um, we have a little ritual in my neighborhood, somewhat similar to the one that Malinowski observed in the Trobrian Islands of the um, exchange of food. Um, <coughs> I, uh, I have a lot of fruit trees, and I give fruit to my neighbor. I don't count the cost. As I don't need all this fruit, so I give it away to my neighbors. My neighbors come around, and they give me things. I have one particular neighbor named Sergio, and every, every year he has a lot of grapes. Every year he makes chicha, which is a sort of a mild alcoholic drink, out of his grapes, and he brings me a big supply of chicha. Now, this can go on forever, the same way it went on in the Torbrian Islands. The people from inland bring food crops, the people from the coast bring fish, they have a ceremonial exchange. Uh, by the way, recently uh, in Chile we celebrated a traditional Mapuche 
an indigenous people's ceremonial food exchange, the way they exchanged food for centuries before they learned that it had to be done with money. <coughs> so, but when we introduce money, and I say, look, well, how can I get the best price for my lemons? How can I make more money than the other guy? It then becomes unsustainable because it's impossible for everybody to make more money than everybody else. As long as we weren't counting and just giving with sharing surplus with surplus, this has to do perhaps with the question about sharing society that somebody raised. And, and as we answer the sharing society, it is a very good idea. We try to practice it. I try to practice it in various organizations that, that I'm in. Uh, but it's, it's part of the solution, and the solution is the sum of many solutions. There is no one solution. But one thing that, one thing that sum of many solutions has to do is it has to wean us from our supine dependence on regimes of accumulation in order to make, make, make uh, society work. So achieving these goals um, requires governability, but there can be no governability in a regime of accumulation. Why not? It doesn't matter what the government does. The government has to serve the regime of accumulation. And Michael Kalecki makes this point when he says that you know, capital has a veto policy, has a veto over public policy. Any public policy, whatever, will be vetoed by capital because if they don't like it, there'll be an economic crisis. So it doesn't matter, for example, whatever. We had a, recently in, in Valparaiso, uh, near where I live, got their new mayor. This new mayor was a young man, and he was a really radical. And he said, I, we just had enough with these sort of middle of the road social democratic politicians. Us young people, we want somebody who's gonna make real change. Well, it was a surprise victory. You know, this 28-year-old guy suddenly becomes mayor of Valparaiso. Well, within six months of taking office, what's he doing? He's running around the world trying to find investors who invest in Valparaiso. Um, and that's what other governments have, what they have to do with the structure uh, uh, we have. So we're, it's ungovernable uh, because, as uh, Habermas pointed out, the real government is in the market. The so-called governments are secondary institutions which have to work within the market and they have to please the market. The one thing the government has to do to survive has to please the market. So we have to change who's in charge here. We, we have to turn things around so that uh, uh, meeting needs uh, is the goal. And uh, there are many different ways uh, to, to, to do it. Now notice that I'm trying to steal the word governability. Uh, if, uh, if you read people like Farid Zakarias, uh, what they mean by governability is simply the ability of the government to enforce the regime of accumulation. The government has to be able to keep uh, wages in check, labor in line generally, it has to keep the populace and the demagogues down. Uh, and so what they simply mean by governability is complying with the status quo. What we're trying to say is no, what we mean by governability is changing the status quo. That's similar with our critique of social democracy. Uh, I'm talking about Joanna Swanger and myself. Uh, we criticize Sweden because we say the Swedish model was inherently unworkable because it collided with the basic cultural structure. Friedrich von Hayek says the same thing. It was basically unworkable because it collided with economic reality. But his conclusion is uh, give up on the welfare state. Uh, Milton Friedman in his Nobel Prize winning speech said, you know, governments don't uh, create runaway inflation intentionally. They create it because they mistakenly try to create uh, welfare states and full employment. If they had just refrained from welfare states and full employment, then they wouldn't have runaway inflation. So uh, we, we make the same observation, but we draw a different conclusion. The conclusion is we, we have to think in terms of, of, uh, of, of, a, different, of, a, of, of a solidary economy or unbounded organization. Um, the Tausch principle with that limited government and separation of the wealth of the nation from the government, government and increasing dependence of were constitutive principles of the nation states formed at the beginning of modernity. That is, the nation states that were formed were formed as part of an international system which had Roman private law as a governing principle. This is the case with 1648 with Holland, the first sort of modern nation state. This is something Wallerstein points out. It was not founded as an independent separate nation. It was founded as part of the European system and it was, was built into the assumptions of those, those systems. Um, in his Collège de France lectures for 1974, 
he starts off with the question, well, you know, how is it that uh, the uh, modern so-called uh, states with a so-called social contract uh, began? And he says, well, I can't for a minute believe that it began with a social contract. Uh, that it cannot be the case that by free consent, people agreed on the basic principles of rule of law, uh, limited government, the government's legitimacy depends on, on uh, respecting the people's rights. People's rights are liberty. Liberty equals property. So property and liberty become a guarantee. The wealth of the nation becomes beyond the reach of the government of the nation. And this is supposedly a contract. And um, <clears throat> Foucault says, look, I can't believe this. I, it's I, it's got to be power. Because for, for classic Foucault, there's always a, a simple answer to any question. Oh. And the answer is always power. <laughs> so, so he wants to sort of trace uh, how it happened. And he discovered something other people hadn't discovered. Uh, many people have observed that before the beginning of the modernity, the sort of uh, combination of Kantian ethics with Roman law with Newtonian physics that sort of defined a, a secular mode of thought, uh, before that, uh, public discourse was theology. All of the, 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 uh, the Reformation, the disputes about the emperor's power and the pope's power, is a, theology was sort of the only public discourse there was. Foucault says, no, I discovered something else. The other guys didn't find it. I were digging around in the library. There's another kind of, uh, of discourse during that period. And that was what he called historical political. And these were stories about wars. And the conclusions of the stories about wars was who won. And who won explains today's society. So it's a way of justifying today's social structure, explaining why it's legitimate. It's because my ancestors defeated your ancestors, and that's why I'm the Lord and you're the serf. And then many other details can be explained that way. And then, and then in this series of uh, historical political narratives by various people telling various stories, uh, there was introduced a, a third kind of narrative. Uh, and this was the narrative of the Third Estate. And the Third Estate brought up the narrative, well, everything was great in the old days. I'm like, you're telling us stories about, in the old days, uh, the Romans conquered us, and, uh, and in the old days, the Franks conquered the Gauls, and that's why things are the way they are today. But actually, in the old days, we were very happy living under the Romans. <coughs> why? Because the Romans respected law. So we could uh, engage in commerce, uh, and we weren't subject to these nobles who keep marching in and stealing stuff because they think they own everything because it's their territory. So, and this was a, an ideological basis for the alliance between the monarchy and the third estate against the nobility, which went on for several centuries under the enlightened despots. And during this period, uh, it became a doctrine that the enlightened despots only had a right to rule if they respected the principles of Roman law. Otherwise, they were not legitimate despots. Uh, Catherine the Great of, of Russia expressed this in a very neat way when she said, so in my empire, there are two kinds of law. There's the law of my government, which is enforced by my officers, and then there's the law that courts enforce, and that law is universal and eternal. And just as Kant said it was, <coughs> the laws of property and contract, basic principle, in fact, and when Kant does his proof of these things with the universal internal. He uses the very same Roman maxims that I, I quoted to you on my first uh, cheat sheet. He goes by, goes by each one of those Roman maxims, and he proves they all follow from freedom, freedom being our autonomy, being the one principle of the different laws according to him. Well, this legal system uh, was held to be universally internal, and where it wasn't, the mission civilisatrice meant it had to be imposed. As, as a point, uh, oh, uh, but this, this had an historical origin. But the historical origin was, in the end, Foucault concludes, it wasn't because there really was a social contract which obliged the government to respect the property rights of the rich. So that, as Adam Smith says, the duty of the government is to, to defend the rich against the poor. Um, what, what happened was that the people who held this doctrine won the wars. So it was, by, it was by military force that the social contract became the official uh, 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 do doctrine. Um, uh, I'll just miss something here. Um, 
So the fundamental problem of regime of accumulation is not that the profits of a few trump sustainability and justice for the many. As you know, every time there's a global conference on climate change and people take pledges that they don't keep and some of them resist, all people are always lining up on the side of the ecological activists against the corporations, as if the problem is that the interests of the corporations won, interests of the ecology lost. But that's, that's not really what happened, and that's, I think, a grave mistake, because it leads to thinking that if we only had better public policies, uh, we could somehow turn this around. But we can't turn around with better public policies, because it's built into the very basic structure of the system that we have to keep the profit motive going, and if that clashes with ecology, uh, it, it, uh, it, it has to clash. So the, the problem is that uh, we all depend on the profit motive, not just the few who are uh, making the profits. So globalization means that nation states function inside markets within a legal framework constituted by private law. I recommend in this respect the book by Carl Renner, uh, The Social Functions of Private Law and its uh, social functions. So this explains my structural problem with the transfer of the tomato operations. You know, why is it that you can move your tomato operations from California to Mexico? It's because uh, since the constitution of the global world system as an expansion of the European world system, uh, private law has been the international law. So, and private law uh, uh, trumps uh, uh, public law in the respect that, and now it's official with the official treaties constituting the World Trade Organization, and other treaties, you, you probably know, but you wouldn't believe if you didn't already know, all the rights that South Africa has signed away, all the things South Africa can't do. It can't impose capital controls. It can't restrict imports. And these are all under this sort of uh, ethical uh, mantle of liberal ethics, which takes the form of a liberal juridical framework which takes an economic form as uh, Smithian economics and its, uh, and its contemporary uh, uh, successors. So um, that, doesn't that doesn't have to be the way it is. That is an historical construction. It's not simply inevitable that if the, if the growers don't like paying wages, union wages, they can go somewhere where there's a union. Um, to succeed uh, in constituting a functional society, we must modify and complement the Tosh principle starting in local daily life. This was a great point of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, that be the change you want to see. And he actually called attention to the point that, well, actually, it's the same uh, A-Dharma. What, what he meant by A-Dharma was without religion or without, you know, the concept of Dharma more or less. It's a traditional Hindu principle that we're all born with a vocation to serve of one kind or another. On its bad side, it has the caste system. On its good side, it has the idea that we're all, we, we all should live as Mahatma Gandhi did, thinking of his life as a series of opportunities to serve. So when he says, you'll be the change you want to see, that is a change which applies at the global level. Because the very same idea, the Tosh principle, is a global principle as well as being a principle in, in one neighborhood uh, after another. So one, one way we, we start to uh, create change is, is changing neighborhoods. In uh, Argentina, there's a movement called uh, ABC, which means the Bastecimiento Basico Comunitario. It means every neighborhood to be self-sufficient uh, in food, primary health care, and housing. So whatever happens in the rest of the world, Every neighborhood in Argentina will have uh, basic security at the, at the local level. So the, another way to put this is that the social bond is prior to the market. And I think we can make a biological, physiological argument for this. We can say human beings have evolved in such a way that social bonding is natural. It's, it's, it's hardwired. So we can, we can make a case that this sort of ethic uh, and all of the traditions that embody this kind of ethic have a much stronger scientific basis than stories about what pure reason is supposed to make, a, make into uh, an, an imperative. Uh, and then if you start with the proposition uh, that we're all one family, of course this is itself is a radicalization of the ancient idea of kinship because kinship 
meant for thousands of years, you're always at war with your neighbors. But now we need to make the inside ethic into the outside ethic. And we can do this because we have human rights. I mean, modernity also has cultural resources. It's not only ancient traditions that have cultural resources. Modernity has, since, especially since 1948, human rights which supposedly uh, grant everything that is in the South African Constitution, uh, but, uh, which is, uh, according to the Constitutional Court, only, in, only enforceable to the extent that it's possible. And why is it impossible? Well, that's because of the story Foucault told us about how the wealth of the country got separated from the government of the country. The government, in principle, does not control the wealth. Uh, Thomas Piketty finds in the countries he studied that the 1% the hold most of the wealth hold about six times the GNP of the country as, as, as inherited wealth. He also makes the observation that inherited wealth on the whole is independent of production. Production would want just the same because the people actually running the businesses today are not the ones with most of the wealth. It's not that the giant corporations have all the money. It's that the people with trust funds, uh, which are hidden <laughs> off in, in which many of which can't be found at most of the money. So the, the wealth is in one place. Uh, the operations of the businesses in another, you know, well-heeled, wealthy, but not on the scale of, of inherited wealth. And the needs are in another place. And, and this, is a, this is a structural feature of, uh, of, of, of modernity. So, but if we, um, if we make the point that the social bond comes first, and we include the rich people in this and as a matter of ethics, you know, they should be doing what Gandhi recommended. Now, by the way, this, the, the ethical doctrine is independent of the question to what extent should, should compliance be voluntary and to what extent should it be legislated and obligatory. That's a separate question. It's not that the, the, the underlying ethical point is that uh, uh, markets are one way to do it. And if they don't work, then we do it some other way. Now, you may think this is sort of obvious ethics, but it's not obvious at all for liberal ethics. Well, for liberal ethics, there's such what they call the priority of the right over the good. And the priority of the right over the good means just for the sake of making sure people's needs are met, you can't take people's property because that wouldn't be right. So in your utilitarian calculus, uh, that which is, violates the categorical imperative that comes wrong. I, I've traced this in IMF documents. If you want, I can send you a paper from one where I show IMF reasoning exactly traces Kant's uh, sort of rigid uh, liberal um, ethics. And we have the agency theory of the corporation, uh, where supposedly a corporation, if the corporation's officers are all agents for the shareholders, and their one and only duty is to make money for the shareholders. So. Uh, and so in some places that has the force of law, and in some places the agency theory of the corporation, and it's the fiduciary duty of fund managers and of corporate managers to do only one thing. Uh, but that's, thank God, that is being challenged today by other theories of the corporation, such as the one I told you from Peter Drucker, the corporation is a community with a mission. Um, so um, new institutions require uh, unbounded organization, and that means uh, unbounded motive, motivations. There are many motivations that are actually at work in the world, and we've got to rediscover them. And we've got to have cases where uh, if the money motive doesn't work, it doesn't matter that much because that's only one motive. We can, in fact, cancel all of our money tomorrow and start with new money. We could forgive all debts. There are all kinds of things that other cultures knew how to do. We seem to be incapable of doing. Uh, but um, uh, in the case of the ridiculous case of Greece, for example, where uh, the uh, Greece is is enthralled by debt, which is supposed to be, according to law, according to liberal principles, unmovable. This debt simply cannot be forgiven. Uh, and that doesn't matter that in 1953 Germany's debts were forgiven, and uh, the Greece was one of the countries that that forgave them. And not only that, but the banks have Greece mortgaged. You know, secured lending means. Uh, that the airports and the highways belong to the creditors. <laughs> and it also means that when they get a huge new loan, they don't get any of the money. It all goes to pay off their old loans. 
Now this is ridiculous from a pragmatic point of view. Anybody trying to adjust culture to physical function would say, forget this and start over. But it is uh, entrenched in a number of layers in the, in the world today. But, um, but it's something that, um, that is also being disentrenched by a whole series of, uh, whole series of movements. Um, so the current thinking tends to be dominated by the currently dominant uh, social structures treating the rules that constitute as natural and sacred and successful achievement of a functional society requires more more uh, imagination. And a little more specifically, domination by finance is another inevitable end of the Tausch Transit Trail. I'm saying if we start with the Tausch Transit, we follow that trail, we end up going where it leads. And where it going leads is where it leads. That is, the, the cultural structures uh, are shaping the course of history in their own way. You should hear what I'm saying? I'm saying that uh, it's not that there is a group of people who control everything. Where is the power? The power is in the hands of the rules of the game. The, what, if, what determines what actually is going to happen depends more on the rules than what anybody wants. And one of the proofs of this is that at the present time, the rules of the game, the basic cultural structure, are leading us to the extinction of the human species. And that is what nobody wants. There's not a single human being alive on the planet who wants that result. Nevertheless, that's where we're going. So, uh, <coughs> the, um, so uh, when we were, somebody might remember before the, uh, the great crash of 2008, made people uh, upset about the uh, uh, liberalization of banks and letting banks uh, loan money uh, in ways that were almost certain not to be repaid. But they don't remember that back in the 80s when banks were liberated, when they were allowed to do more things and make more loans, that was supposed to be a solution. Why was it a solution? Because business was lagging. Well, business always lags. And Keynes tells us, he's quite right, there's always a lack of demand, there's always a lack of inducement to invest, so there's a permanent need to do something to stimulate more business. And what they did was they made it easier for banks to loan money. And what they're doing now is they're printing money, uh, all in a desperate attempt to make something work which inherently doesn't work because the whole principle of it is, is exchange. I give something, uh, you give me something, I want to make a profit, you want to make a profit. That simply doesn't, doesn't add up. As in, and it doesn't add up no matter how complicated you make it and no matter what policies the central banks um, it up. Um, and this becomes uh, entrenched in uh, the rules of fiduciary duties, which mean that uh, fund managers are forced to uh, handle funds in ways that comply with the profit-making imperative, even if the people who own the stock don't want to. I advised a number of old ladies, old widows in Santa Barbara, who wanted to know what to do with the portfolios their husbands had left them. And there was not one single one who was interested in making more money. They all had all the money they needed. All, all they wanted to know was, what was, the, uh, what was the corporate social investment of this company? What's it doing for, for the environment? Well, um, Merck, is, uh, Merck has published a fake journal uh, pretending to be a medical journal uh, running uh, articles praising Merck's product. Well, we cross out Merck. We're not going to invest in Merck. But on the other hand, Merck, voluntarily, the board of directors voted that they would develop a vaccine for uh, tropical fever even though there was no money in it because the people who had tropical fever couldn't, couldn't buy it. So, okay, that's one for Merck. Well, that's one in one. Maybe we will vote buy it Merck. But the question of how am I going to maximize my return never even came up. Uh, and not with one single widow that I, that I, um, that I talked to. So there, there's an uh, enormous amount of, of uh, goodwill in the world. Okay, let me tell I'm going to tell one more story about how much good will there is in the world. And then I'll, I'll stop. Um, there's a wonderful movie you should look at. It's called Palestine South. I think you can probably find it on YouTube. And Palestine South is a movie about how refugees from Palestine were received in Chile. And it makes, it makes you proud to be Chilean because they received a good number of refugees uh, who had, lived, had undergone untold suffering in the Middle East. And when they got to this little town in Chile where they were to be called La Calera, which is one of the towns in the world that has the most Palestinians, 
the, the town band was out to play for them. They were waving the Palestinian flag. They did everything to help them out. And then a couple months later, you find these Palestinians grumbling. They said, well, I, I first started my business uh, making Arab sweets, and I got four orders a day. Now I'm lucky to get four orders a week. And I wouldn't have come if I knew it was going to be this hard. I'm just not making any money here. So, so we have an enormous outpouring of goodwill, which we can sympathize with. We can understand how happy the little Chilean school kids are to be uh, learning the Palestinian national anthem and, and learning the Arab dances and so on. They're all very happy, uh, and it's normal to human nature, but economic reality clashes with all this goodwill. Mm -hmm. I think that's a microcosm of macro. I think there's an enormous amount of goodwill which clashes with economic reality. Well, then I'm here to tell you that economic reality is not real. Uh, it's a cultural construction, and we can reconstruct it. <laughs> First, I, I want to make a point that um, we really do need an epistemological break. Um, uh, why, why do I say epistemological break when the paradigm shift is so much more common? Uh, sometimes I do say paradigm shift, but I really mean epistemological break. Why? Uh, because uh, Kuhn's idea of a paradigm shift is a shift from one paradigm to another. And Bachelard's idea of an epistemological break is giving up an old way of seeing things and raising the whole problem to another level. It's about being able to think capitalism and socialism both at once and many other alternatives. It's about pragmatism. It's about an ethical commitment, an ethical commitment to making things work for everybody. And once you've got that ethical commitment, or once you, to the extent that you can find an existing cultural resources or create through moral education or uh, what, uh, what um, Koshik does at uh, the Graduate School of Business, what he calls authentic leadership, uh, you, can, you can create uh, uh, a commitment to solidarity or find it, then uh, what you do breaks all of the old categories because you know, everything is open to be, being uh, rethought and rediscovered and in some cases invented and in some cases uh, revived. Well, why do I want to insist on this so much? It's because many people aren't even asking the questions that you're asking. <laughs> they're, they're still in the old paradigm, uh, which is a completely different assumption about the world. Let me give an example. The uh, OECD uh, recently made a study of uh, Houting, um, and it was a, I mean, a series of studies of places around the world, and this was just one place they studied. And one thing you wouldn't believe about this OECD study is how normative it is. You can forget about social science being an empirical study that's value-free. They use the word should in every other sentence. And when you don't use should, they use must. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about what, how things should do. Uh, one of the things they should do is they should evaluate the community work program and the, the EPWP, the Extended Public Work Program. Once the people have some experience in this program, are they qualified to work in the private sector? <laughs> and what is their track record? How do well do they do as workers in the private sector? They also want to know to what extent we're crowding out uh, private enterprise by using public subsidies to do things that would otherwise be done by private business. Well, these people are in a totally different universe. There are people who still believe that the idea of working for wages will continue into the future. They don't believe uh, that we're living in a world where the market is not supplying work for everybody simply because the market isn't there's not that market demand, and that this is going to be getting more intense in the future. They don't, they don't really realize that we have to prepare for a whole different conception of economy where people 
they have decent livelihoods, uh, but they don't have them through employment in the private sector. And the government, as it's now constituted, is incapable of rescuing them. They're totally off the. And they still believe that the more production, the better. They don't believe that we are at an ecological crisis and we're about to destroy ourselves. And one reason we're about to destroy ourselves is that we just keep producing more and more as if producing were the goal and making money by producing the motive that runs the goal. So these people don't ask any of the questions you're asking, and they're in charge. We're not. So we have a, a great deal of work to do simply to explain that we're living in a different world from the world that the experts from the OECD and, and many others are, are, are living in. Um, now, about, um, first, first, of all, first I want to say something about power. Uh, I think one thing we have to admit is that the class struggle is over and we lost. I say we, being somebody from a working class family. Uh, the working class just doesn't have power, and what little power it does have, it's going to have to use allied with somebody. The military is just too strong. The United States military backs <coughs> up the militaries of the other countries. The mass media are, are too strong. Uh, the ideology is too deeply embedded. Uh, South Africa is too hamstrung in what it can do because of its insertion in the global system. Uh, there's simply well, no way we can win uh, a, uh, a, a class struggle. I, uh, I feel like echoing Nelson Mandela when he said, uh, we cannot win a war, but we can win an election. I'd say we, we cannot win a class struggle, but we can win an ethical transformation. Uh, we can't. We can't. We can't do that. And that. Uh, now I want. I want to give a couple of reasons for optimism about why we can do that. One is, we don't really have an enemy. Why not? Because there is nobody who has a real interest in the status quo. There may be some people who think they do. There may be some people who think that you know we're rich, and to maintain our riches we have to keep the poor people down, and. To maintain our riches, we have to stop the, these crazy green ecologists from destroying our businesses. There are some people who think that, but they're wrong. That is, this is, it's a conceptual error on their part to believe that the existing system is working for somebody's interest, and in particular, working for their interest. And most of the rich and powerful people I know uh, seem to realize that even better than the poor people. You know, I, I happen to know a lot of wealthy people, partly because of where I was an undergraduate, and, uh, partly because of my law practice, and partly because of my students. And I, I find a, a great more awareness that we need a basic systemic change among the uh, people who supposedly are powerful, although in my view they're not powerful. It's the, it's the rules, the structure of this that really has the real power. Um, and then I found among my neighbors who are just ordinary people. Um, the, um, so it's an, it's an educational task uh, to make people aware, number one, of what their real interests are, and number two, that it's possible to do something about it. Well, getting back to whether it's possible to do something about it, this uh, comes back to perhaps the question of shared intentions or, uh, or shared power. Uh, or, or creating a kind of people power that actually does produce things. I mean, I'm, I, I'm talking about a productive people power uh, of the sort that is developing, and particularly in Argentina and Spain and certain countries where the whole large sectors of the economy that are uh, people generated independent, independently of, uh, of, uh, of the sort of main a capitalist system. And one way we do that is uh, it's the people's immediate interest. Uh, for example, in Argentina, in, uh, in the Argentine collapse, uh, 
um, many factories closed uh, and many continued going because the workers just kept them going. Well, why did they keep them going? Well, one reason was that these guys are maybe 40, 50 years old. They worked in this place all their life. Uh, by the way, one of these places, uh, the car factory made my jacket. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, um, and in the labor market in Argentina, there's just nothing much that a 50-year-old can do who's been doing the same thing all his life. So really, they pretty much had to stay where they were and do, do, the, do the best they could. Um, and, but they pulled it off, and they, they, they pulled it off, generally, uh, with public support. Uh, the, the generally, the, the people who are sympathetic with their and legislative support. Uh, there's now a law in Argentina that whenever a country, excuse me, whenever a company goes bankrupt, uh, it must be offered to its workers. The workers must have an opportunity to reorganize it and run it. And only if they fail can the bankruptcy judge uh, take some, some other measures. There's also a law in Argentina now that every large company must do triple bottom line accounting uh, for people, planet, uh, profit. So uh, these things can work because it's to everybody's interest. And it's a task of education to show this to everybody's interest. There may come some future time, there probably was a past time, when it, is, it really is to the interest of the rich to keep the poor down. But at this point, until the poor get a lot better off than they are, uh, it's not. Uh, the, uh, the, the press, I don't know how aware people are of in Africa as they are in Latin America of the advance of the narco culture, where whole towns and whole police forces and sometimes whole armies and, are taken over by uh, the counter power of poor people who have taken things into their own hands and gone into the drug business and made a lot of money and they know how to corrupt the police and the army to keep them down. They have sophisticated weapons, sophisticated communication. This, uh, I think that people are very aware that uh, if we don't do something, uh, we don't need a socialist army because we already have a socialist army and it consists of the, the narcos. They are uh, creating a society which either will become just or will become ruled by uh, and a seemingly unstoppable underground movement. Uh, another optimistic point about uh, shared power is that um, uh, uh, here I think maybe we need to remember Hannah Arendt's definition of power, which is the ability to act together, the ability to act in concert. Uh, that, that's the reason why in the military coups in Latin America people are forbidden to talk together. We've, get more than two people talking together on a corner, you're liable to disappear and after the uh, Argentine or, Mil or uh, Chilean uh, coups. It's, uh, the, so uh, just conversations, just talking together is, 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 a, way of, uh, is, a, is a way of bonding and starting to, to build power. And a great deal is known about this. Uh, psychology is a science which has not been standing still while well, the other sciences have been advancing. And one thing that psychologists have learned is uh, how to build uh, people with greater bonding, greater sense of empathy, greater capacity for, for, for cooperation. So social and emotional education and moral education are, 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 are fields where there is a lot of knowledge. David Hume said in the 18th century that any proposal for social reform that proposes an improvement of morals is imaginary. That's no longer true. It doesn't have to be imaginary. And we have some, some moderately large-scale experiences in, in, that, in, that, in that respect. It's a matter of applying knowledge that already has. Another bit of good news, either good news or bad news, is all of these people suffering anomie in the large city where nobody stays very long and there's not no time for bonding. Uh, there are people who wish they had bonding. And one of the proofs is criminal gangs. People join gangs because they want to belong. Another uh, proof is Pentecostal churches. Uh, there are all sorts of churches which are, uh, which are gathering in the lost. And they're, they're finding 
Christ, and of course they're finding Christ, they're finding community, they're finding meaning. Uh, so we're, this is a, uh, a human tendency to want to belong, which is waiting for people like the Marcos and the Pentecostals and you and me <laughs> to uh, work with it uh, and to create uh, solidarity. Uh, so it's not, um, it's, it's not, it's not impossible to, uh, to create something that most people in their heart of hearts are longing for and are often willing to make great uh, sacrifices uh, to, to get. Much of this goes together with uh, mental health and recovery culture uh, from uh, alcoholism and, 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 and drugs. I don't think we can separate building a new culture from that. And also, uh, much of it you can find on websites. Uh, I, I recommend particularly the uh, asset-based community development website it's headquarters at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. They have done a great deal of uh, learning how to uh, build uh, shared intentions, how, how to build collective intentions. Um, I might mention that one of their interns who worked for them before he went to law school was uh, Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of wisdom uh, available in the world about. Uh, how to work at the grassroots level. Uh, Gavin himself is a walking encyclopedia on, on this sort of thing. You should read the reports of what was achieved at, uh, at Beckerstall and at Bloemfontein. Um, but, um, um, but I will admit it, it, is, it, is, it is daunting. It's, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, discouraging. And I myself some find that, sometimes find that my, my failures outnumber my successes. But every now and then I succeed in, uh, in uh, creating some shared intentions. And I won't tell about my failures and successes, but <laughs> I can assure you that there have been a considerable number of both. But I think what I guess my message is not so much to add to the existing wisdom on how to build community at a local level as to realize how important that is, but also to realize how that fits in to the global need to uh, <coughs> escape from uh, a world that's necessarily run by regimes of accumulation and for that reason uh, unsustainable.